And good afternoon. Thank you very much for making it on this week's Writers on Writers over Triple Expressive Podcast. This is your host, Patrick, Gor- Patrick Greenwood, on a wonderful St. Patrick's weekend and no rain in the forecast here in Southern California. We are joined by a one incredible writer, physicist, and computer engineer extraordinaire going back many, many years in the space industry, Edward Lerner. Edward, thank you very much for joining today's podcast. My pleasure, Patrick. Good to be here. Well, thank you, sir, for coming on as well. I have to tell you, uh, I had an opportunity to read your bio and uh, obviously being an esteemed publisher of over 20 books, including several collaborations uh, with other writers as well. uh, You have an extraordinary uh, inventory of content that you've created. We'll definitely dive into the content as well and talk about some of the storylines. But first, I got to really got to talk a little bit about a history here. So I did have a chance to read your bio, mm-hmm. and I did notice that you also uh, not only worked in several very high tech companies, but obviously you worked at Bell Laboratories. You had a chance to work at Honeywell, and also reading your background, you also worked at Hughes Aircraft as well. Right. So my question to you, sir, is when were you at Bell Labs? Seventy three to seventy eight. So my father was there from sixty three to seventy two in Whippany, New Jersey. Okay. When I was when I was four years old, I was in that building when I was four in my sitting in my father's office, flipping through time these little punch cards that were coming out of the machine and throwing them on the ground. And of course I didn't I wasn't very popular with my dad after that. But I remember our world started with key punch machines. That was that was compute in the nineteen sixties and then the nineteen seventies. And then the evolution of the space program. And obviously, you know, many of us are young and remember the Apollo program. Obviously, you know, we remember the beginning of the space shuttle programs, obviously some of the you know, history and tragedies that happened during that program as well. When you were a younger man and coming up into the world, were, were you born to become a physicist? Were you born to wanting to study space travel? Was there something in, in, in your childhood that said, you know what, I really want to get into this kind of work? Absolutely. I was at a very impressionable age when the space age started, which is to say Sputnik, Mutnik, (laughs) Explorer, Vanguard. Uh, I was uh, in college when uh, the moon landings happened. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I was very much immersed in that. Uh, I never worked with rocket scientists, but I did meet a couple of astronauts along the way. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, it was quite a ride working in high tech all those years. Yes. Well, it was also a lot of people that are not from the earlier generation do not realize that, you know, the amount of memory and storage that existed back then was four bytes, not even that. And today we're obviously into the petabytes, you know, we can park into our laptops. And so the idea of putting a man on the moon in 1969, or even launching rockets even before that, and having some idea of trajectory of keeping them in guidance to hit, you know, an object 30 million miles away, and doing so with, you know, technology they had to build pretty much on the fly. It's extraordinary that where we are even today. Oh, yes. The technology that was used in the uh, the moon rockets in the 60s and 70s is completely different than what's being considered for the Artemis program, yes. presuming we go back to the moon sometime soon. Or, or Mars. I know Blue Origin talks about the idea of going to the Mars and, and those things as well. Yeah. One of the reasons why the computers seem so primitive that were used in the space program is it takes a long time to uh, get something space rated. 
-hmm. and it takes even longer to get it human spaceflight rated. Yes. So once something is uh, approved mm -hmm. for use in a, a manned mission, it takes a very long time to even consider replacing it with something else. Mm -hmm. So towards the end of the Apollo program, when astronauts carried a laptop aboard, the laptop had far more computing power and storage than was used in the avionics that actually flew the mission. <laughs> That's crazy. That's absolutely crazy. Now, did you notice when, now I noticed that there was a picture of you online that shows you sitting in one of the space shuttles itself when you were working on that particular program. Now, many people that are of the, of the younger generation don't understand what that really meant to go from the Apollo program, which is basically rockets flying in the air, to now going into an airplane that pretty much launched like a rocket, but basically was gliding down and the idea of reusability of aircraft being used for space travel as well. What did you remember from that generation and what really kind of astounded you? You thought this is actually a pretty cool thing or was it just a complete waste of money at the end of the day when it was all over with? Okay, one clarification first. Mm -hmm. That picture of me at, that you saw on my website, I was in a space shuttle simulator, mm -hmm. not the physical shuttle. Understand. Okay. And uh, you call it a glider for uh, reentry purposes. Uh, it has the aerodynamic properties of a brick. Mm -hmm. When I flew the, the simulator, uh, many times I tried to land it as a glider never once succeeded. <laughs> My hat's off to anyone who could actually fly that thing. Yeah. Okay, to your question about uh, was it useful or not, mm -hmm. it was only semi-reusable. Mm -hmm. You know, Nowadays, when you talk about reusable rocketry, we're talking about uh, the Falcon 9 and Falcon X from uh, SpaceX. Mm-hmm where uh, pretty much everything is reusable. With the space shuttle, uh, there were these big solid rocket boosters that were attached to it that uh, were used once and discard. Eventually they tried reusing some of them, but it took major re-engineering to do it. Mm -hmm. There was the big external fuel tank mm -hmm. that got dumped into the ocean. And it was really only the logically speaking, the upper stage that the, uh, the human occupied part that was reused. Mm -hmm. um, in the process of going from a NASA goal of fully reusable to this uh, kludge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a polite word. <laughs> there was compromise after compromise. Yes. You know, for uh, Mercury and uh, Gemini and Apollo programs, mm -hmm. and now for the SpaceX uh, Dragons, mm -hmm. the, the human-occupied capsule is sitting on mm -hmm. the very top of the rocket stack. Mm -hmm. And if something goes wrong, there was uh, an escape option, mm -hmm. you know, a rocket on top of the capsule that mm -hmm. pulled the humans in the capsule away from danger. Mm -hmm. And as the space shuttle design evolved to less and less reusable mm -hmm. and various compromises, mm -hmm. the space shuttle wound up being attached to the side of mm -hmm. the rocketry stack. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why we had the first shuttle disaster yeah. when the- uh, Challenger. Yeah. yeah, the Challenger, when the O-ring burnt through mm -hmm. and uh, the, the burning solid fuel then punched a hole in uh, the fuel tank. Mm -hmm. There was no escape. No, no, there wasn't. I remember that very well. Now, one of the things that's interesting is uh, listening to your history and, and obviously your, your professional life that you live. When did you start wanting to say, you know what, I'm going to write that down. I, I think there's a story here someday. Did you was that during the time you're working in, as a physicist, working in the tech industry, or was it afterwards? When did you first realize, you know what, I may want to start scribbling some of this stuff down. This could really be a good book someday. It was on a dare, actually. <laughs> um, after I'd been out of college for several years, I went to night school to get uh, an MBA. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, I went through several years with no time to do any reading. And then once I finally finished the program and I had some time to read, um, I was trying to make up for lost time. I was reading a lot mm -hmm. and I was uh, critical of some of what I was reading mm -hmm. and about some book that was eminently forgettable and therefore forgotten. Mm -hmm. uh, I said something along the lines of, uh, this is terrible. This is stupid. And my <laughs> wife said, so I suppose you can do better. Do better. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so at that point I had no alternative but to try. Right. Now, my first novel called Probe mm -hmm. uh, was written before I got involved with NASA. Uh, mm -hmm. You've highlighted my physics background, mm -hmm. but uh, much of my work was as a computer engineer and then as a manager in the computer field. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of ironic. Uh, some of the major characters in that first book mm -hmm. were... Uh, NASA related. Mm -hmm. Much of the action took place in the Washington DC area, mm -hmm. which I had not lived in. Mm -hmm. uh, but by the time uh, I finished writing the book mm -hmm. and changed employers a couple times and uh, the book was published, I had uh, relocated to a uh, Washington DC suburb, switched to working for Hughes Aircraft as a NASA contractor. Mm -hmm. So, uh, mm -hmm. The writing got ahead of my uh, personal life, mm -hmm. but it all worked out. Yep. Mm -hmm. Now, once I uh, was working for Hughes and did have this NASA background, mm -hmm. yes, I started accumulating interesting background to go into future writing. Mm -hmm. And there's yet more Washington and uh, NASA content that went into my second novel called Moonstruck, which mm -hmm. does not involve share is not a romantic yeah. comedy i wasn't gonna go there i saw the cover said now there's she's not there anywhere thank god but no i i did see that that was kind of honors that you actually used that title yeah uh, but more broadly than your specific question pretty much every job i had in high tech mm -hmm. has contributed in one way or another to some story or some book mm -hmm. You know, there's this adage that writers should write what they know, and it doesn't really apply directly to science fiction authors because I don't know that many aliens or time travelers personally. <laughs> that have survived time travel or been an alien at one point, yes. But uh, I do have that useful background for my characters. So, so let, let's talk about character development for a moment And as you're writing. The reason I wanted to kind of pose that opening question is, I've always had this, you know, thing in the back of my head about sci-fi writing. And I don't write in sci-fi. I write more fiction. But I have friends that write in sci-fi. And I, I kind of ask them, you know, it takes a certain character to understand how to create characters and vocabulary and, and interstellar travel and planets and aliens and, you know, weapons in between, all the other things. When you're sitting back in the day working at Hughes or working at Honeywell or even working on NASA stuff, and you're sitting in a room and someone says, we need to come up with an idea of how to make this happen. How often does that eventually either start with an idea that's so far featuring, kind of like sci-fi, mm -hmm. that ends up becoming reality in some form? I know Gene Rottenberry gets a lot of credit for things like the transporter and the and the talking communicator and stuff like that. But when you think about when you're in that room back in the inception of, of, of you know technology and space and engineering and things like that, going, this is not invented yet. But however, we all have to brainstorm. Now, is that same brainstorming, do you apply that when you're writing as well? When you're having to think about, what am I going to write about? How am I going to write a sci-fi about a planet, interstellar, and whatever? How much brainstorming do you do when you create your stories like that? There's a lot of brainstorming. Mm -hmm. the, the books I write uh, very much deal with the use of science and technology mm -hmm. to solve some problems. Mm -hmm. And generally, it's science and technology that doesn't exist yet because it involves other species, other worlds, mm -hmm. the ability to travel farther and faster than we've been able to, or something even more speculative like time travel. Mm -hmm. Because I'm a scientist and an engineer, uh, I want to avoid the, the plot technique that says, 
What's driving everything is some evil character who is just unbelievably, unbelievably maniacal and perverted and corrupt. Mm -hmm. uh, I want uh, the problem that drives things something that even well-intentioned people can uh, find themselves uh, complicated by. Mm -hmm. So there'll be some key technology. I'll, I'll take a particular example. I wrote a story about uh, medical nanotechnology, mm -hmm. which uh, involved little nanobots that uh, swim around in the human body and apply first aid. Mm -hmm. And in order to have a story, I then asked myself as an engineer mm -hmm. and also pestering every uh, biophysicist, <laughs> doctor, biologist I knew. Okay, how would this be designed to do, right. to do good? How might it nonetheless fail? Mm -hmm. How would a prudent designer try to prevent that complication from happening, prevent that failure mode? How might it fail anyway? And I go through a few cycles of that, and I did. And eventually, a biophysicist friend of mine said, it's okay. This is a story. <laughs> That's right. It's <laughs> fiction, pal. <laughs> the battery does die at some point when the thing's running around inside. So, But it is fiction, yes. Okay. Well, And on that particular point, one of my gripes about how nanotechnology is often shown in fiction is – no one gives any thought to, well, how the heck is the thing powered and mm -hmm. what makes it grow? Yes. You know, it's it's too simplistic to just say it's going to eat the earth and turn everything into gray goo or paper clips. Or 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 you remember way back in the day, what was it, Fantastic Voyage with Rocco Welch that yeah. a movie where they became minuscule and then they went inside the body to perform brain surgery and they came out through a tear through the eye and eventually they got put on the floor and they became this. It's like, that was like, well, even before people even thought about nanotechnology being used, but that was what, the 1960s that that, that movie came out. Yeah, it was amusing. <laughs> uh, um, Good word. <laughs> one of my uh, firm rules is this universe seems to require conservation of energy. If I don't understand where the energy for something comes from, it does not go into a story. Yes. So back to the nanobots, mm -hmm. they, in my book, they metabolize glucose and uh, glycol and other prominent uh, biomolecules the same way the cells of our body do. So there was a continuous supply of energy for them. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Well, we're on with Edward Warner on, we're on Riders Warner with the Triple Expresso. We're going to take a brief moment to hear from our sponsor, and we'll be right back. Get ready for an electrifying and nail-biting ride with Dying to Tell. The psychological thriller reviewers are calling Impossible to Put Down, and one of the best books this year. Part-time journalist Aoife Walsh investigates the disappearance of IT specialist Matt Gallagher, who vanished into thin air while on his honeymoon. But as Aoife uncovers the truth, she unwittingly puts herself and her loved ones in the crosshairs of a deadly killer. With gripping suspense and spectacular twists and turns, this edge-of-your-seat page-turner will leave you breathless. We are back on Riders and Riders with the Triple Expresso with the host Patrick Greenwood. We're on with Edward Lerner. Edward, I have a question as, as we're starting to talk about, obviously, nanotechnology and other things as well. The covers of your book, when you have them designed or, or if you're doing your own designs or you have people designing for you, are you designing the cover before you write the manuscript or are you creating the manuscript first, then you're creating the cover afterwards? How does the cover kind of come about? Okay. Well, in my case, the book, the story has always come first. Mm -hmm. And I've had input into cover designs, but I've never designed one myself. I'm traditionally published. Okay. And publishers uh, pick their own illustrators uh, if you're lucky, the uh, illustrator has read the book or has asked for some input. Mm -hmm. In fact, for what will be my next novel to be published, I just got an email today from the publisher asking me to propose a few scenes in mm -hmm. the book that I thought were good candidates to be the cover. Mm -hmm. If uh, a, if an author is unlucky, mm -hmm. then the uh, 
the cover has nothing whatever to do with the book. <laughs> so you are traditionally published. So let's talk a little bit about the publishing journey because a lot of the people that come on this podcast are either self they're self publishers or the hyper publishers like myself. I'm actually published the Austin Macaulay, where I had pretty much pretty much a lot of say as far as the cover and, and the material. When you went through your first writing, did you query a lot of publishers or did you query just a very few of them? How did you kind of start out getting that traditional publisher contract? For my first novel, I did a lot of querying. Mm -hmm. uh, I eventually got uh, an offer from uh, Warner Books mm -hmm. and uh, had a deal with them. Mm -hmm. uh, it was only when uh, my second novel was available as a serial in a popular science fiction magazine, Analog, mm -hmm. that I had uh, a contact through which I was able to get an agent. Mm -hmm. Are you still agent today? Do you still have an agent representing you today? I'm mixed. I would mm -hmm. use an agent for uh, large publishers. Mm -hmm. But part of my journey has been switching somewhat to smaller publishers mm -hmm. who are a lot more open to a variety of story ideas. You know, big publishers right now are especially into the endless series that will not die and the 457th vampire book. <laughs> and and you, you're killing me here, Mecca. That's so true. It's like they wanted to keep going because they make money, right? It's it's a money-driven world. And I think that it's hard as a writer to say, look, this thing has to, the, the character eventually is 104 years old. It's time for him to move on. They want the, you know that thing to keep going as well. But how did you combat that with the publishers and say, look, no, 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 this, this story has to go this way. There has to be an ending to that. How did they accept that? Well, I've done two series. Mm -hmm. uh, one is a five book series with uh, science fiction grandmaster Larry Niven. That's the Fleet of Worlds series. Mm -hmm. And uh, Larry is so prominent in the field mm -hmm. that nobody tells him what to do. <laughs> uh, and he gets tired of series too, so it really wasn't an issue. We were able to wrap things up when we wanted to. Mm -hmm. He has actually tried on some occasions to wrap things up only to have the fans come after him and wanting more. So uh, sometimes it's a bit of a challenge to uh, to pick things up after you think things are, are wrapped up. Mm -hmm. How uh, did... How did you and Larry, I know you, you and Larry do a lot of collaboration. You worked on some series together, but one of the questions that comes up quite often from young writers is when they're trying to get their first book on the market, you've obviously have a whole bunch that are out there. How did you do your marketing? How do you continue to do your marketing today? How was your, how do you reach out to your followers saying, Hey, I've got this new book. What sort of kind of your marketing strategy as well? Ah, uh, you mean besides talking to people like you? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, nowadays, publishers do comparatively little promotion unless, you know, you're Stephen King or someone like that Daniel who doesn't Steele. need it. Daniel Steele. Yeah. They, other than that, you're on your own pretty much. Yeah. So it's social media. It's Facebook. It's blogging. It's my website. Mm -hmm. It's appearing in venues like this. Mm -hmm. uh, before the pandemic, uh, I did a lot of cons and uh, book signings. Mm -hmm. uh, I need to get back into that, but uh, I'm out of the habit. Mm -hmm. Now, are you finding people, the example, you know, you obviously have a following as well. When you were doing kind of the appearances, was it science fiction, you know, book fairs? Was it local bookstores? Or was it more like you kind of went to different cities? Or did you just stay in the Washington, D.C. area when you kind of did your appearances? It was mostly local, but mm -hmm. in years when the World Science Fiction Convention is in North America, mm -hmm. I typically went. Mm -hmm. And did you find not only yourself, Larry, and others that are going there, but do you see this as a growing base of readers wanting to get more into sci-fi, or is it more an older generation of people are reading sci-fi? Where are you sort of sitting where the readers are really coming from, from an from age perspective? It's... Uh, it's a crazy uh, world right now. I think <laughs> the traditional audience for traditional conventions is very much an aging uh, population, an aging demographic. Mm -hmm. uh, 
this is a generality and there are always exceptions to generalities. Uh, but I think the younger generation that's interested in uh, speculative fiction of any kind, science fiction or fantasy or horror, are more into uh, the media tie-ins. Mm -hmm. So Dragon Con, which is big on media personalities and mm -hmm. uh, television tie-ins and movie tie-ins, mm -hmm. uh, is growing and growing. And Worldcon, which is the traditional uh, science fiction convention, has been shrinking and shrinking. Yes. It's, and it's happening not only with Comic-Con as well. Comic-Con's here in San Diego, comes every year. Uh, even during COVID, I think it, it, it took a couple of years off. But when it did finally ramp up again, it wasn't the 100,000 people that it used to see. It was it used to be dubbed the largest convention that would come to San Diego. And that was one of the reasons they were considering expanding the convention here was because Comic-Con was such a dominant for the downtown area. And now it's sort of coming back. Now there's many Comic-Cons in other cities and it's sort of but it's not the same energy it was before COVID where you could have characters, movie stars, everybody showing up for it because it was just the event, you know, to obviously get in front of people as well. So if these things sort of kind of shrink, what do you see then as the next generation or the next way of getting marketing out for a book? What, what do you see as kind of the next step of marketing that may have to replace doing some of the on-premises things? As much as I hate to say it, it's TikTok. Oh. At least it's just banned. <laughs> I have refused to do that so far yes. um, or YouTube book trailers, mm -hmm. but uh, that's just me being stubborn. I know plenty of uh, people uh, of my colleagues who are doing it. Well, well, correct me if I'm wrong, but have have you ever done an audio book in any of your books? Well, many of my books are available in audio form. I have not been the one reading them. Okay. Have you, is that going to continue? Has that been successful for you? Or has is, is the print, is print and Kindle been the most successful so far for you? It's varied with time. You know, mm -hmm. when I started, there was only print. Mm -hmm. Kindles uh, seem to outsell print in uh, science fiction these days. Mm -hmm. But uh, for a lot of my books, especially the ones that have been out for a few years, uh, audio has become very important. Mm -hmm. Now, I noticed that in your bio as well, it, you also mentioned that some of your books have been translated into different languages as well. Other than English, what other languages have been the most popular so far for your books? Um, German probably uh, is the most popular, mm -hmm. but uh, some of the other languages, and I won't remember them all, there, there were at least 10 languages. Uh, some of the books have been in Chinese, Japanese, Korean. Mm -hmm. Um, one book was in Hebrew, uh, mm -hmm. a couple of books were in Greek and Polish. Mm -hmm. So it's quite the mix. It, it, and I, it was very impressive to see that because a lot of times people think about, well, maybe I should translate my book into Vietnamese or translate my book into Japanese or whatever. Have you had fans reach out to you and say, Edward, can you please create this character or, or can you bring this character back? How much feedback do you get from your audience asking you to either keep a series going, bring a character back, or, or more importantly, explain the story. You know, they didn't like the ending for some reason. They love the ending, but they didn't understand the backstory behind the ending. How often do you get that kind of feedback from your, from your readers? I get lots of requests to <laughs> extend the two series. <laughs> and uh, in the case of the Fleet of World series with Larry, my answer is, I never say never, but I'm at a stage where I would like to concentrate on just my own universe. Understand. When I worked with Larry, it was revisiting his universe. I understand. How can people get hold of you? What is the best way that people can you know, contact you, download your books, get access to some material, read your blogs? What's the best way to get hold of you? Okay. Well, they can see on the screen here uh, how to spell my name. And uh, spelling learner correct is correctly is important. Mm -hmm. If you get that part right, uh, my blog is blog.edwardmlearner.com, of course. My website is edwardmlearner.com. I'm on LinkedIn and uh, Facebook and, of course, Amazon mm -hmm. as Edward M. Learner. So those are all good venues to find out about me. 
Excellent. Well, Edward, it's been a pleasure to have you on today on Writers on Writers over at Triple Espresso on a St. Patrick's Day weekend. I wish you the very best, especially with your new release coming out as well. I'd love to have you come back on the podcast again after your book comes out. We can be able to talk about that and any other potential new series you may be thinking of as well. But it's an absolute pleasure to meet you, sir. And thank you for making the time for being here today. And thanks, Patrick. I've enjoyed our conversation. Thank you. And everyone, thank you for making it on this weekend's St. Patrick's Day. Writers and Writers over at Triple Express Podcast. This is your host, Patrick Greenwood. Stay safe, stay sound, and stay dry. Take care.